So welcome back to Child Health Safety and Nutrition. This is your assignment three. Uh, we're going to dive right in. Uh, this course is really important. Uh, when it comes to safety, uh, there's nothing more critical when you are looking after the um, other, other children, other people's children. Um, the inf information that you learn in this course will really guide you um, in informing you of, of the importance of safety. So let's get started. Let's take a look at this, uh, a closer look at this slide. So rem remember when you are diapering a child, remember to um, ensure that you are supporting the child. Uh, it, it's very important that the child does not fall off the change table. So infant and toddler caregivers must know how to safely change a child's diaper, how to patiently and respectfully help a young child learn how to use a toilet, and how to respond sensitively to toileting accidents. Remember that young children are often fascinated by their bodies and all the things their bodies can do. They may also be fascinated by and sometimes fearful of the, the washrooms they use every day. They approach the washroom the same way they learn about other things through exploration. So young toddlers might love to flush the toilet, turn faucets on and off, watch, to watch toilet paper unroll and explore the sounds their voices make in a washroom. Unfortunately, all of this learning comes at a price. So because bathrooms are full of bacteria as a caregiver, you must be prepared to promote learning and healthy hygiene. So it's really critical to keep washrooms and changing areas clean in a child care program. Uh, diapering and toileting are major sources of contamination. Unsanitary practices can put you and children at risk for illness and infection. So this lesson will focus on general practices uh, for maintaining hygienic diapering and toileting practices and procedures for helping a child who has had an accident. At some point, you will likely help a child learn how to use the toilet. So toileting accidents are a typical part of the potty training process for many children, as it may take time for them to appropriately recognize and respond to their body's signals. The best way to prevent accidents is to maintain regular toileting routines and carefully watching for signs that a child needs to use the restroom. Holding the genital area, squirming or moving uncomfortably could all mean a child needs to use the restroom. Diaper infants or toddlers, uh, when diapering infants or toddlers, encourage them to try to use the restroom at least every two hours. For toilet training toddlers, be sure to remind them to use the restroom before you go outside, go on a field trip, get into a car, or begin any new activity that involves leaving the classroom. There are also important times to diaper change diaper children who are not yet potty trained. So hand washing and diapering. So proper hand washing procedures are essential during diapering. The order in which hand washing is completed during the diapering procedure is critical for the environment to be free of contamination. There are two times adults must wash their hands during diapering. First, adults must wash their hands uh, before they gather diaper supplies, and then again during the final step after they have put cleaning and sanitizing solutions away. So infants and toddlers must wash their hands or have their hands washed after a clean diaper is put on them and they are fully dressed. So. Regarding the diapering procedure is much easier than actually changing, reading the diaper, sorry, regarding, reading the diaper procedure is much easier than actually changing a diaper. So whether this is your initial training or on diapering, or you've changed, <coughs> excuse me, 500 diapers, it is important to review each step to assess if you are conducting the procedure correctly. So toileting procedures. Toileting, as with diapering, has procedures that must be followed to reduce the spread of germs. Toileting has additional health considerations, 
as toddlers learn self-help skills and participate in their toileting routine. So infants and toddlers could also drown in toilet bowls. They may play and explore in the restroom, uh, contacting contaminated items or surfaces or otherwise injure themselves. For this reason, infants and toddlers should always be supervised in the restroom by both sight and sound. So let's take a look um, um, at, at the slide. So number one, uh, before you place the child down on the change table, uh, spread out in number one, the clean diaper, and then you place the child on top of the clean diaper, supporting their head, okay? Always supporting their head. So you gently, respectfully place the child down. Uh, you uh, talk to the child. You help them stay safe and calm. And then in num in uh, the third, uh, number three, you move the sides of the diaper to the side and you start taking off the, the diaper, the soil diaper. So you remove in number four, the soil diaper, you close the flaps and you place the soil diaper in number five in the container, in the garbage can. Then you get in number six, a wet wipe, and you wipe the child from front to back, always from front to back. Then you bring up the uh, diaper between the legs up to their belly button, and you make sure that it's it's secure and that there will be no leakage. And then you take the, each flap from each side and uh, close up the diaper. Then the child has been diapered. So you must remember to wash your hands after you change the child's diaper and it is a good procedure to wash the child's hands even when they're uh, very, very small. Okay, so uh, if you're using gloves, uh, gloves though recommended and required by many programs do not automatically protect infants, toddlers, and adults from exposure to germs, unfortunately. Ad adults often feel a false sense of protection when they wear gloves. They think, think carefully during cleanup as you could unknowingly spread germs that touch your glove to the next surface your gloves touch. So always remember to wash your hands prior to using gloves <clears throat> if hands are visibly soiled. Always put on a clean pair of gloves, uh, provide appropriate care, remove each glove carefully, grab the first glove at the palm and strip the glove off, touch dirty surfaces only to dirty surfaces, uh, ball up the dirty gloves in the palm of the other gloved hand. With the clean hand, strip the glove off from underneath at the wrist, turning the glove inside out, touch the dirty surfaces only to the dirty surfaces, and then throw out uh, the, the glove. So sometimes parents push their ch children to get potty trained. So what are some of the barriers uh, to potty training? So maybe the child is not ready yet. Sometimes toddlers are pushed into potty training before their bodies are ready. It is not impossible to help a child who is not ready to learn to use, it is, it is impossible to help a child who is not ready to learn to use a potty, but is definitely more of a challenge. So families may not be ready yet. For families to be ready to make the commitment, they must be ready to help the child with potty training at home. So bring all of the supplies needed and work as a team with the teaching staff so the child has consistent reinforcement. Transitioning from diapers to the toilet may involve families emotionally letting go of their baby and embracing the child becoming a preschooler. Uh, cultural expectations vary as well. Um, some families and cultures believe that children should be potty trained around age two for girls and two and a half for boys. Others think it should happen earlier. Um, so, you know, talk to the family, uh, see what they think, and then uh, work as a team uh, to, to help the family uh, uh, help their child get potty trained. So timing is a factor. A child may be physically but not emotionally ready for potty training. 
Perhaps a sibling has newly arrived, a parent is deployed, the family has moved, or other family changes may make potty training an additional stressor that more than a welcome task. It is best uh, under these circumstances to delay potty training until the child and the family has made it through most of the emotional upheaval in any transition. Okay, so how do you know that a child is ready to be potty trained? So um, some things that you may consider is that the child may have an understanding of the concept of cause and effect, has an ability to communicate, including sign language, that they may uh, need to use a toilet. They can remain dry for at least uh, two hours at a time during the day, or uh, their um, diaper is dry at nap time. Uh, they have a bowel movement on a regular and predictable schedule. They can follow simple directions. They can sit on the toilet and feel a sense of elimination. They show discomfort over their wet or soiled diaper. So some kids, you, they, they don't like wearing um, a wet diaper. Uh, it feels uncomfortable. And also some children show an interest in going on the potty and being more autonomous. Um, and uh, whatever rate, wherever the child is at, we need to be respectful. Um, it's really important to document when you change diapers or when a child goes to the bathroom. Uh, families uh, would like to know. If you put off documentation, something will likely come up and you'll have to rely on your memory, memory rather than recording it accurately. So have a system, have a system, system in place. Okay, so we've talked about hygiene, we've talked about uh, regularly cleaning the bathroom and making the toilets are flushed regular uh, all the time. Um, always making sure that the floor, the doors, the walls and the toilet seats are clean, uh, making sure paper towels and other trash are thrown away properly, uh, always making sure that running water, soap, paper towels, plastic bags uh, for soiled clothing and toilet paper are available, making sure that you put disposable gloves on before handling soiled clothing or diapers, remove gloves before handling clean diapers and clothing, um, always wash your hands after helping children use the toilet, assisting with soil clothing or touching contaminated surfaces. Even if you were wearing uh, disposable gloves, you should wash your hands. Make sure all children and adults wash their hands properly. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. And so let's talk about social and emotional learning. Um, this is a really important area of childhood development where children grasp how to interact with others. They also learn about various emotions and how to control themselves and respond to them. While social emotional learning uh, development processes begin at birth, preschoolers benefit from an environment that also helps develop their various social and emotional aspects by focusing on all development areas, the whole child development develops. So let's look closely at side two. What exactly is social emotional learning? So it has five major areas. So self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. Cell is the very foundation that allows all higher level thinking to evolve. Children need to feel school as an extension of home where they can count on the adults around them for support. Brain's research has indicated that emotion and cognition are interwoven processes. The positive impact of cell has been further substantiated by studies in the indicating a gain of 11 percentile points in achievement, increase in pro-social behaviors, improvement of attitudes towards school, and reduction in depression and stress. Including cell and curriculum benefits academic gains. Ensuring proper messaging continually of respect and appreciation for all living things and celebrating diversity is essential. So again, uh, let's look closely at the slide. So what is self-awareness? So as children evolve through early childhood and begin to interact with other adults, 
and peers, they consciously or subconsciously develop aspects of self-awareness. They identify emotions, develop self-confidence, gain self-efficacy, and become conscious of their, of, of their perception. So what is uh, self-management? Even as preschoolers, youngsters may grow overly reliant on adults, parents and other caregiving adults or teachers in daycare or preschool settings to help them manage themselves. Parents too can help kids through their self-management journey by promoting impulse control, encouraging self-motivation and teaching them goal setting and organizational skills. Social awareness. Preschool is likely the first formal environment where kids encounter individuals from different cultures and those with social backgrounds diverse from their own. It is in this context that influential adults can help share, shape preschoolers' views on empathy, diversity, compassion, and tolerance. This aspect of cell can also help preschoolers understand and overcome other social biases. What, is, what are relationship skills? So group settings such as those encountered in preschool environments offer an ideal opportunity for children to hone their social and emotional relationship building skills. It is in this context that children experience, learn, and practice cell elements such as listening, communicating, collaborating, problem solving, sharing, negotiation, and conflict management. That's a lot of different um, elements to relationship skills. Responsible decision making. So uh, making decisions, responsible decisions um, is, is important. So although the words responsible and decision making might seem very advanced constructs in the context of preschoolers, they really aren't. In preschool, kids learn the basics of responsible decision making, such as when to give up a toy to another peer, waiting a turn to play with it, or what the consequences are for not putting away crayons and books when playtime ends. As part of their cell experience, preschoolers evaluate the consequences and benefits of available choices and learn to make decisions appropriately. Although some parents and untrained adults might not realize it, but simple gestures such as a child offering fellow preschoolers their crayons or willing sharing a lunch cookie with a classmate help advance a child's cell. Even though these actions may be taken for granted, uh, they are a critical step towards greater cell in preschools. Um, so how do, um, how and why does cell matter? So um, there are many benefits to cell. So when children uh, are able to use these skills uh, in their classroom, within schools, families, within their community, um, they are able to manage life's challenges. Um, they are getting ready for higher levels of schooling. They uh, perform better in school. They, it helps them uh, behave better. Uh, they are um, ready for for, for, for school. Uh, a focus on cell also results in better long-term academic and socioeconomic performance. Uh, educators and mainly uh, all those adults responsible for a child's care uh, should continue to build cell, cell skills in this area. So using children's books is, is a great way uh, to encourage cell. So reading and discussing children's books is an excellent way to invite children to identify the character's emotions and relate the character's experience to their own. Um, literature is so important in the classroom. It, you can introduce a new social or emotional skill. You can carefully choose, uh, carefully choose high quality books to read aloud at circle time. Sometimes you can choose a book related to children's recent social or emotional behaviors in the classroom. When you see some of the children having trouble sharing toys, you can read aloud uh, The Rainbow Fish by Marka Fitzer. When you find a child crying because her friend uh, hit her, you can read things like Hands Are Not For Hitting by Elizabeth Verdick. These are uh, a few of the books 
that you that support your social and emotional curriculum. So there's there's so many books, and I on the slide there are a few options, um, even books like uh, When I'm Feeling Sad by Tracy Maroney, uh, great great books. Uh, there's other things that you can do to uh, encourage so. Uh, so uh, there's a variety of activities. Uh, for example, like a helping hands chain. Uh, you can trace and cut out multiple hands for each child, place them in a pocket or baggie that is easily accessible. As you recognize a child's helping hand behavior, have the child get a hand from their pocket and connect it to the class's helping hand chain. The hands can be placed on the wall to wrap around the room. On a regular basis, celebrate how long the helping hand chain is getting. Hand puppets. Uh, create character puppets by having children color or paint the pictures, cut them out, and glue them to craft sticks. Once dry, children can bring their puppets to circle time and act out the story while you read the story aloud. Later, they can take the puppets to the story area or puppet center, and, um, and they can uh, create stories. They can create dialogue. Uh, they can uh, use their memory to um, to restate the story. Uh, another idea is pass the feeling bag. You can place an assortment of scenario picture cards in a pic in a bag. As music plays, the children pass the bag. When the music stops, one child picks out a card and identifies it. Have the child talk about how each scenario or item makes them feel and why. Allow children to take turns pulling out picture cards. So there's so many things that you can do. Um, you can find lots of ideas on Pinterest or on Google. Uh, things like face collages, share boxes, uh, singing songs. Uh, the other thing is uh, coaching on the spot. So when you coach children on the spot, teachers help children realize what they are doing, understand how their actions affect others, and choose positive alternatives. Let's look at an example. So two children are playing in the blocks area, let's say Riley and Amon. Uh, they, they, then Ethan builds a firehouse in the block area. Riley grabs the fire truck from Amon and Amon cries. The teacher should crouch down and look Riley level into his eyes calmly and say, Amon was still using the truck. When you took it away from him, he got upset. What could you do to make Amon feel better? After Riley says he is sorry and gives back the truck, the teacher can say, next time, if you want to play with the toy Amon is using, could you ask if he will share? Follow up by observing Ethan of the kids uh, and provide immediate positive feedback on the desired behavior. The worst thing a teacher can do is grab the truck from one child and give it to the other. This is very poor role modeling. The teacher's modeling is so important. So children learn um, through modeling. Children learn by observing other people, getting ideas about how new behaviors are formed, and using the ideas to guide their actions. So in the classroom, you can move closer to children when needed as a nonverbal cue to um, help them rethink behaviors. Model appropriate, warm, and respectful behaviors at all times throughout the day. Um, use nonverbal gestures and context, such as nodding the head, giving a thumbs up sign, touching ge children gently on the shoulder to send messages, uh, using simple language as walking feet, please, or use gentle hands to set expectations and give reminders. Acknowledge uh, a kind act on the spot or praise a group effort for a job well done. And place a hand gently on a child's hand to redirect attention and behavior. Uh, when children see teachers demonstrate these non-invasive strategies, they often smile, use their gentle hands, say please and thank you, give hugs and high fives, and use words to express their feelings. So using cues is a great way to engage children in appropriate social behavior. So uh, let's uh, look at slide three. And uh, this slide is about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder uh, and, and the symptoms and what this looks like. So 
At, at times, uh, you will see that preschoolers may have difficulty paying attention, following directions, and waiting or taking their turn. These behaviors can be common and age appropriate, or they can indicate the need for an, an, an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder evaluation. At times you may wonder if a child has ADHD or is just being rambunctious and acting typical for his or her age. In general, a teacher can support a child in the following ways. Recognize and use the child's strengths. This will also increase self-esteem. The child will be more engaged if they feel that you understand their struggles and are on their side. The child will likely already have received an abundance of negative feedback in their short lifespan, lifetime to keep to keeping it to a, a minimum is best. Positive interaction should be uh, three times that of negative interactions. In the content, concept of or situation is new, early intervention and support can be required. So can preschoolers um, be diagnosed with ADHD? Yes. Children as young as age four can be diagnosed with ADHD. How can you tell if a preschooler has ADHD? Preschoolers with ADHD are more likely to be suspended from school or daycare because of their dis disruptive behavior. So um, what does what does ADHD look like um, in a three-year-old, for example? Uh, inattentive, uh, fails to give close attention to detail or makes careless mistakes, has difficulty sustaining attention, does not appear to listen, struggles to follow through on instructions, has difficulty with organization, loses things. Uh, what is hyperactive impulsiveness? So fidgets with hands or feet, squirms in a chair, has difficulty remaining seated, um, runs about or climbs excessively in, 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 the, in the area, difficulty engaging in activities quietly, uh, talks excessively. Children with ADHD may require an alternative activity in another location to napping. Schedule activities that require more attention during times they routinely have more energy and focus, possibly but not always in the morning. Uh, you may have to arrange areas for work and play so the, ch the child knows what is expected in what environment. Have a consistent routine. This helps children anticipate what will happen next. So, uh, what are the causes of, of ADHD? So research has yet to determine the exact causes of ADHD. However, scientists have discovered a strong genetic link since ADHD can run in families. Other factors in the environment may increase the likelihood of having ADHD. For example, if a mother smoked cigarettes or drank alcohol while pregnant, exposure to lead or pesticides in early childhood, premature birth or low birth weight, uh, brain injury. So scientists are continuing to study the exact relationship of ADHD to environmental factors, but point out that there is no single cause that explains all cases of ADHD and that many factors may play a part. Uh, the following factors are not known causes, but can make ADHD sim symptoms worse for some children watching too much television, eating sugar, family stress, such as poverty and family trauma. So it's important uh, to address ADHD at an early age. Uh, preschoolers with ADHD are more likely to have difficulties in daycare or school, including problems with peer relationships, learning, and a higher risk of injuries. An early diagnosis is important so that the child can get the, need, the needed help to minimize these problems. So uh, having an IEP could be written, an individual education plan. It's a written plan that provides individualized special education and related services. Um, every child with ADHD is different. Some need help paying attention and managing distractions. Some need help staying organized. Others need help getting started with their work or finishing their work. Some students with ADHD have trouble staying seated or working quietly. Let's look closely at the slide. So one of the symptoms of ADHD is inattention. 
So often the child has a hard time paying attention, daydreams, often does not seem to listen, is easily distracted from work or play, often does not seem to care about details, makes careless mistakes, frequently does not follow through on instructions or finish tasks, is disorganized, frequently loses a lot of important things, often forgets things, frequently avoids doing things that require ongoing mental effort. Uh, the child could uh, have symptoms of hyperactivity, is in constant motion as if driven by a motor, cannot stay seated, frequently squirms and fidgets, talks too much, often runs, jumps and climbs when this is not permitted, cannot play quietly. Another symptom is impulsivity, frequently acts and speaks without thinking, may run into the street without looking at, for traffic first, frequently has trouble taking turns, cannot wait for things, often calls out answers before the question is complete. Um, and it, it, you may have children blurting out things while you're, you're uh, doing a read aloud and frequently interrupts others. Um, so the good news is that every child uh, with challenges, the good news that is that every child with challenges to thrive um, can, can have the interventions placed in their program to help support them. Teachers play a big role in a child's educational success, especially those children that have ADHD. Teachers can make small, impactful changes in the classroom activities and overall attitudes and integrate teaching strategies to support all students. Um, a teacher has the opportunity to positively impact their students with ADHD for many years to come by providing them with a structured classroom set up that encourages learning, enforces discipline, and improves their self-esteem. Uh, students with ADHD can learn they are capable and gain confidence. So uh, as mentioned earlier, if a teacher is able to uh, help the parents understand that their child may need to go to the doctor so that uh, they can uh, assess whether the child has, has ADHD would be very beneficial for the child so that the supports that they need are put in place. So this uh, is the end of the third assignment. Uh, I wish you all the best as you continue uh, learning and growing in this course. And if you have any questions, please do uh, reach out. Make it a great week, everyone.